Good afternoon, and welcome to PDM 301, Cost Containment and Contract Language. For those that attended our previous seminars of 101 and 201, welcome back. For those new to the class, welcome. While it may be summer, school is never out at Paran, and we are back in session. Today's topic, under 301, this is going to be more of a senior level class, if you think about it from high school. I mean, we've we kind of went over the geometry, we covered some algebra in the earlier or the earlier sessions, but now it's time for some calculus. Now, if you didn't make it to 101 or 201, you might be a little lost, might be a little overwhelmed, no worries. Your Haran team is here to help educate, engage, and guide you through this topic and answer any questions that you, that you have once class gets out. Your presenters today. First is myself. My name is Michael Jeffries, and I am a Vice President and Consultant with Haran. As a subject matter expert in the healthcare sector, I work with clients on finding better ways to impact benefit spend from market innovation, new ways to communicate, or better processes that will make a difference in my clients' business and members. I deliver strategic change through insight designed to impact plan performance as well as efficiency. And joining me today for color commentary and questions is Judy McKee, who is also a Vice President and Consultant. Judy, would you take a minute to tell them about yourself? Good afternoon. I've been fortunate to work with Haran for over 23 years and manage a block of 1,000 plus complex employers with self-funded medical plans. My key words are trailblazer, collaborator, champion, and connector. My tenure in this industry, as well as work with complex clients combined with professional drivers, have served me well in tackling the business of Rx and bringing that expertise to Haran clients. I'm glad to be here today to help share some of what I consider to be one of the more complicated but exciting parts of our work. Great. Thanks, Judy. A couple of housekeeping items before we get into the presentation. Uh, first is in regards to questions. So we won't be answering questions along the way during the presentation, but you can submit those questions and we will go with them at the end. Reason being is the information tends to build on top of, of itself and your question might be answered during the presentation or we want to be able to see if there's a pattern of questions and have to answer uh, the same question maybe, maybe once. In addition, for those that are applying for the uh, continuing education, just the notify you that OC certificates will be mailed to you. What are we going to be talking about today? We're going to go over four key buckets. First one is strategies for your drug list. What really works? Then we're going to move on to contract language because the devil is in the details. It's more than just the discounts on your spend. It's what the contract says. Then we're going to move on and talk about some RFP tips and then finish it up with talking about some alternatives. And we're going to have a couple of programs that are going to complement your existing PDM strategy, and we're going to talk about one that's actually going to replace the traditional PDM model. Let's take a moment to quickly review what we discussed in the last session, PDM 201. We'll start at the top. Remember, we, we translated some pricing terms. We talked about WAC, AWP, rebates, rebates dispensing fees, and MAC. Then we moved on to talk about network discounts, how they're derived from the average wholesale price. Now they're negotiated by the PBM. We also looked at different ways to bid your RFPs. We touched on the new school, Truveris, an online reverse auction where, where the focus is more cost driven, but we also talked about your traditional. It's good for those that can't, can't carve out or want some more planned flexibility and customization in their PBMs. Then we touched on carve in versus carve out, the pros and cons between the two. Carve in is when the medical carrier handles both your pharmacy and the prescriptions. But there's also the carve out where they where you carve you, you contract directly with the PBM and you have a medical carrier relationship as well. We also touched on how they make their money. With that, review on some pricing concepts. Central pricing items. It all starts with the wholesale acquisition cost. WAC. It's the anchor. It's where rebates come from. Rebates are determined by the WAC and are negotiated by that manufacturer. It also drives AWP, the average wholesale price. The average wholesale price is 120% of that WAC cost. But the AWP also is used for the discounts. Now, the discounts come off of that, that metric, and there's also negotiated by the PDI. Let's hear a couple other pricing items. First one's your dispensing fees. Those are what's paid to the pharmacy when they, when they fill a prescription. Applies to both your brand names and your generics. And you also have the MAC, the Maximum Allowable Cost, which is a containment strategy that is applied to generics. 
And Michael, there are many acronyms, WAC, MAC, AWP. As a reminder from last seminar, is there any set price for drugs? Uh, unfortunately, there isn't. This is the one commodity we see out there where there is no set price. It's a very gray area. If you think about, think about if you had to buy a car, and you went on the lot and you want to say, how much is that car? And they tell you, well, it's $1,000 off of the manufacturer cost. Well, what's the manufacturer cost? Well, they won't tell you what it is. That's kind of the, the gray area that we deal with with, uh, with PBMs. We're going to talk about some strategies to help at least narrow that gap a little. We also hit on some trends. What's going, current, what's going on in the current environment? Will we see more integration with the medical carriers so that they can save money, increase their market leverage? The extension of patents to help keep competition at bay and continue high profits for the PBMs? We also touched on pharmacogenomics, which is precision medicine, which is testing to see how the body breaks down drugs. But the future state, we see more transparency, such as legislation on rebates, allowing them to go to the member versus the employers. More outcome-based contracts, establishing metrics to measure how well a prescription actually works and holding the manufacturer to it. More innovation, we're seeing carving out a specialty out of plane coverage, for example. New players are entering the market, Amazon, J.P. Morgan. And lastly, the biosimilars. They're an alternative to specialty medications. They provide similar outcomes, but they do it at a lower cost. Now we hit on the review. Let's get into the meat of the presentation. Time to get your hands dirty. We're gonna do some gardening. It's the start of summer. Lots of people are out working in the yard, planting, weeding, watering, or in my case, getting rid of a mold that keeps eluding me. We're gonna do some PBM gardening. We're gonna plant some ideas and strategies that are gonna grow and help you impact your PBM plant spend. We're gonna start with clearing the ground. We're gonna do that through plan design. Then we're gonna prepare the soil through some tools and tracking. Once we have that soil ready, then we're going to start picking your plants. Contract language, again, doubles in the details. We're going to talk about how to minimize margins, get some effective guarantees. And then we have to tend to it. We're going to tend the garden, tending it with a focus on specialty, where we can isolate and contain costs. So let's get our gloves on and let's get to work. Clearing the ground. First thing you do when you clear the ground is just promote generic utilization. They call it generic conversion. The simple first step, increase engagement through education. Explain to them how the plan design works. How it saves them money. It's lower co-pays or discount amounts, but provides the same outcomes. But you want to find a PBM that has high average generic fill rates. You can see in front of you, there's a chart that has average fill for four different PBMs. Now you can see from PBM 1 to PBM 4, the difference is about 3.5%. Now that 3.5% may not seem like a big number, but that can generate substantial savings when you're talking about the average cost for a brand name drug versus the average cost for a generic drug. But now if you want to find a PBM that has that high generic bill rate, you want to use that PBM for their resources. Help them help with your communication campaign. Let them build it for you. They've done it before, let them do the heavy lifting. And Michael, just as a reminder, when is a generic drug not work for a member? That's a great question. So a generic may not be the best fit for someone because it may have side effects, it may not produce the similar outcomes, it may not process well in their body. So the generics are not necessarily an option which would require them to have to stick with their, their brand name alternatives. Then you can adjust the number of tiers on the plans. The idea is to increase and expand to drive utilization to those lower tiers. If you look at the chart inside that red circle, you can see clearly the trend is going more towards the four and five tier designs. Now those four, the fourth tier and that fifth tier, those are intended for specialty RX. And within those tiers, you want to consider putting a percentage in there versus a copay. Now I know that that does bring up a concern, and that's where cost and culture start clashing. Because some employers may look at that as simply passing the costs on to the, to the membership through that percentage, that percentage switch. Well, while yes, it does push more burden onto the plan member, it does drive utilization. It does help to contain costs. This is one of those topics that at Haran, we want to be able to sit down and have a conversation and make sure that we find that balance between cost and culture. You can also adjust your co-pays and your cost shares. And, we, and to do this is we want to look at some benchmarks. Benchmarks are always good to have. Let you know where the line is 
what to charge when you're still trying to maintain a competitive benefit loss at the same time impacting costs. You can see for co-pays as well as co-insurance. The co-pays, there's the average for the fourth tiers, again, and that fourth tier is typically where you find your specialty meds. Below that, you see the average co-insurance for, re for retail, mail, and retail 90. Keep in mind, retail 90 and mail, those are for your 90-day supplies. Clearly, there's a price break involved. So you can see underneath the mail, on average, $18. But if you think about it, rather than paying $10 a month for three months under the 30 to get a 90-day supply, it's more cost-effective for them to do it through mail order. At least this lets you know what the delta is between what you're charging and what you could be charging inside the plan design to maintain that competitive benefit. Some other actions. Co-pays after the deductible, specifically when you're talking about high deductible health plans. For example, let's say you have a high deductible health plan where the deductible and the out-of-pocket are 2,000 single, 4,000 family. You can make an adjustment where you maintain that deductible of 2,000, 4,000, but you push the out-of-pocket maximums up. Push it up to 2,500, say 5,000. So now that you have a difference between the two, that's when you can insert a copay. So once the member hits the deductible, they start sharing the cost through the pharmacy copays until they get to that out-of-pocket maximum. You can also adjust your pharmacy network. So for example, if you have your standard national network, you go into that network, keep it on a national basis, but you remove one of the two big pharmacies, say CVS or Walgreens. What that allows is for your discounts to improve for the remaining pharmacy, whether it is CVS or Walgreens. A similar approach can be provided from a specialty, their specialty pharmacy as well. Let me get to one vendor. And Michael, just as a reminder to those who have not um, evaluated this, that if you carve out one of the major chains, you still have Kroger's, Walmart, Costco, and Target. So it doesn't eliminate all the change, just either CVS or Walgreens. Exactly, exactly. So you're not compromising the national network. Essentially what you're asking people to do is cross the street. Okay. So you typically see them across, across the street from each other on the corner. Then you want to drive 90 day supplies. Simply put is your current plan says mail order or 90 day retail is optional. You convert that, make it mandatory. You give them that first two fills. They can do the first two 30 days for the first two months, but then they have to convert to the 90 day. Again, provides cost containment to the plan, but they can still maintain the regimen. And another thing you can do is the high deductible health plan preventative list at 100% for chronic conditions. Can you talk a little bit about this? Absolutely. So while you're maybe thinking that this additional co-pays or additional co-insurance is a takeaway from the plan, you can also give back to the plan by allowing the members to get preventive drugs on a, on a, no, uh, on a no cost share, first dollar coverage underneath the plan. So if the drug is on that preventive list for the condition, they can take that without costing me anything. So it's a, it's a way to have a balance when you're looking at these sort of plan design changes. Now we've cleared the ground, let's, uh, let's prepare the soil. Starting with your utilization controls. You want to have utilization programs and you want to make sure that the people, the members are educated on how they work. You pay for these underneath your PBM contract. Now the primary strategies probably sound familiar to you. And that's because if you look inside the circle, overwhelming majority of PBM contracts have those top five things. So your prior authorization is just got to get permission first before they write that prescription. Your quantity limits is it limits the, the quantity that a prescription can be written for certain drugs. You refill too soon, that's for those that don't wait for the end of the 30 days or the wait to the end of the 90 days or contain, contains waste. Your step therapy, which is try this before that, contains waste as well. And then you have your family, uh, then you have your formulary exclusions. That's for, say, compound drugs or over-the-counter medicines. This is designed to contain costs. But these programs are only as good as the engagement as the results that they trigger. You want to make sure that you find the right PBM that not only has these, but how well do they implement. Now, there's a couple of rising stars. First one is mandatory generics. So the mandatory generics, it allows them to, allows the plan to say, okay, if there's a generic alternative versus a brand name, then the plan will pay for the generic and force people to go to that, that fill. Then you have predictive modeling, which is where the ID future risk patients through data and the PBM then coordinates that care to the primary care physician using their electronic medical records. 
pay at RX Carbac. Now, it's been growing steadily since 2012. You get 63% of larger companies that do have a carve out situation. But it could be challenging for smaller companies. Those that have less than 500 covered lives, that could be as a result of carve out fees offsetting the savings, or maybe simply because they're not big enough and the contract won't allow it. However, for the smaller employers, we're seeing more employers entering consortiums. Now, what the consortiums are is it's the ability for like minded employers to enter in together for, for mass. So a group of 150 comes together with other groups and they might be able to get a contract for an employer that looks like an employer of say 2000. And what that gives is better contracts, which means stronger contract language, better discounts. Now for those that are carved out, and the survey that, 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 was, that was run is, in the next two years, if you're carved out, do you plan on staying carved out? Or you look like you're carving back in? The overwhelming majority, once people carve out, they tend, to, they tend to stay carved out because they're getting better deals. But on the other side, for those that are carved in, asking them if they plan to stay carved in or carved out in the next few years, overwhelmingly, those that are carved in say they're going to stay carved in. Now, that could, it could be driven by the fact that they don't have the option to do so, or they just don't understand the benefits or the ability to carve out. And some considerations when evaluating the strategy are administration, data fees, customization, and flexibility, as well as the member experience. Precisely. So it's not just a black and white who has the best discount. You have to take into consideration all of these other variables so you can get to that, again, to that balance because you don't want to disrupt the culture in spite of the cost, and you want to make sure that you're not giving up any systems or existing processes that are working. Before we go into rebates, uh, we want to take a minute. We want to talk about the two different types of PDM models that are out there. There's traditional versus pass-through. For your pass-through, the way the pass-through works is you pay that PDM an admin fee or a fee per, per script that can vary by client size. They charge you a per employee per month, per member per month, or per prescription. It varies on the uh, cost of $1 to $4, depending on size and what you choose. you receive 100% of the formulary rebates received by the PDM. Now, not 100% of all rebates, but of the formulary rebates, because the PDM does get different forms of rebates, for example, access or market share rebates. So you get all that are generated from the formulary list. You also receive 100% of the AWP discounts. What that means is there's no margin. There's no difference in the discount that they charge to you versus the discount that they pay to the pharmacy. You've eliminated that profit margin. But the discount guarantees are typically lower underneath these contracts. And the reason the discounts are lower off of that EWP is they're losing margin. The loss of those rebates, they don't have the margin in there to subsidize higher discount guarantees. But the contracts are more transparent. Reason being is they have nothing to hide. The only margin that they are making is for that administration fee that you're paying at the, as I mentioned at the very top per, 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 per script or per um, admin fee. Versus the other side of the coin, when you go to traditional, under the traditional, which is what the majority of people have, there's no admin fee or script paid to the PBM because they don't need it because they're getting margins in other areas. Now, the formulary rebates, rather than getting a full pass-through that you saw in the pass-through model, you can get them passed through to you, or you can get a percentage share. You have choices. And you can also come as a credit to the medical fee, or you can do it from a percentage share. It varies on the size of the company and the type of the company. And there is a price difference between what the PBM charges the client and the price they pay to the pharmacy, and it's typically not disclosed, not the amount anyway. The reason being, that's a huge margin area. It applies both to the discounts and the dispensing fees. But the contracts are a lot less transparent. The reason they're less transparent is, well, it's kind of a secret. They don't really want to let you know how much the PBM makes because they're getting into those different areas. And is pastor better for larger groups who are more credible, predictable, with less turnover? Well, yeah. So, it, it, again, it's not, not hard and fast, black and white, what, what one you should go through. But if you're more predictable, more stable from a claim standpoint and from a size standpoint, it does make more sense to go through that that pass through model because you are getting the full formulary rebate. 
So let's talk a little bit more about those rebates. You want to make sure you maximize those rebates that are being received. Be greedy about it. But the PBM is. This is a big margin area. By that profit area from the PBM, they make it on not only the volume of drugs, but the level of rebate based on the volume of those drugs. So for strategies, if you receive 100% pass you on all rebates, both retail and mail, or look at how many people are receiving pass-through rebates right now. In 2017, you had 59% of employees that were, that were, that were receiving pass-through rebates. In the most recent, you can see a climb. It's now 63% are getting some form of pass-through pricing. Now, if you're unable to get the, the full pass-through, you can also just negotiate a flat rebate across all brands and generics and seek a minimum guarantee. But regardless of which way that you go, you got to make sure you compare the rebate offers from each PBM. Figure out what drugs are eligible for rebates. Do the math. What that does is that just brings down and eliminates some of those PBM margin areas. Now, we're never going to eliminate all the margin because they're in business, but what we want to be able to do is get them to a reasonable level. Now, with the rebates, you have different rebate options. Now, both small and large employers both receive rebates. Now, you can see 80% of small employers receive them. 87% of large employers receive them, but you can receive them in different areas, different types. You'll see 100% of rebates, there's that pass-through. That's the best negotiation strategy. Now, it's a question of whether you can get it with or without that minimum guarantee. The reason it's the best negotiation strategy, it helps with budgeting and forecasting. Large employers are usually more successful with this approach, but we're starting to see more growth in the smaller employer section as well. Now you can see between small and large, employers is making up about 50 so percent of the type of rebate options that are being used. But you also have the percent share of rebates, both with and without those guarantees. Also an opportunity, and again, available to different groups of different sizes. It makes up about the next third. And then lastly, there's a flat dollar amount. With that guarantee amount, rounds out the rest. Now, that's not to say you have to go top to bottom from best to worst. You have to take into consideration cost, culture, and how budgeting, how budgeting works within an employer. So there's a couple things on this slide. One is I just heard that Anthem is going to be sharing rebates on the medical side for inpatient and outpatient, specialty drugs and brand drugs dispensed, and that's typically for large group employers. So that's kind of exciting to see that they're going to start sharing medical not just pharmacy rebates. Yeah, that's huge. So that, 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 we could do it a whole other seminar or webinar just on that alone. So we talk about rebates. We're talking about rebates that are processing through the pharmacy side of the plan. Now, you have prescriptions that process through the medical side of the plan, and those do generate rebates, and they can be sizable. But as employers are getting more educated about this, PBMs are becoming more open to sharing that portion of the rebates as well. And then the last thought is when you have a flat dollar amount, many employers, even larger, decide to do that because they either want to make sure those dollars stay within the benefit plan, so they do it as a function of administration, or rebate checks are not transparent in a division or type of drug or person, and so it would be hard to, to spread across different divisions if you have budget lines that are directly impacting different parts of the organization. Exactly. And again, when we're talking about taking the right strategy and going down the right path, these are the conversations that we want to have with our clients to make sure that we understand those sorts of variables so that we can implement what best practice could look like. Guarantees. I keep talking about guarantees in, in the earlier slides. Let's talk about what kind of guarantees. First one is you want to negotiate guarantee discounts. Now, when you talk about discounts, what, you want to, what we want to focus on is negotiate where it benefits the most. You want to get the right drug at the right discount. It's a real savings opportunity for employers. And we want to get it multi-year, not just one year, not just two years. We want three years or more. So, for example, you may receive a proposal that says that you can get retail of AWP minus 19. What we want to do is we want to make sure we negotiate on that discount with an increase over the course of three years. So, yeah, year one is AWP minus 19, but year two, let's get this to 19 and a quarter, year three, 19 and a half. What that allows to do is it helps offset just the normal inflationary cost of cost increase of prescriptions. 
if they talk a big game about this, about how good the discounts are, get these discounts in writing. Tell them to put their money where their mouth is. But in addition to just getting the multi-year and getting a strong discount, you want to get a little more granular and figure out what qualifies as a generic drug. Because lower discounts apply to AWP if a single source generic is categorized as a brand, even though technically it is a generic. We're seeing more and more employers are being able to implement these discount guarantees, which is having the PBMs work harder to earn your business. Plans with generic discount guarantees, over three quarters of them have that. Now, plans with brand discount guarantees, a little less, just over half. The reason there's such a big difference between the two is generic discount prices are pretty stable, so it's easier to offer a discount guarantee against that. Brand cost is unstable, it's volatile, it goes up higher and higher and outpaces generic, which makes it harder for them to offer a discount, which is why you want to get those guarantees to help contain your costs. And those guarantees, you want to make sure they have substance, you want to make sure, they, make, make sure there's some, some meat around there. For example, avoid bundle guarantees, keep them separate. And what that does is that prevents an easy guarantee from subsidizing a hard guarantee. For example, plan has a guaranteed brand AWP discount of 20%. But at the end of the contract here, the actual AWP for brand was 19%. They missed the discount, missed it by 1%. But on the generic side, the guarantee was AWP minus 85, but in actuality, it was even stronger than that. It performed AWP minus 88%. So just on that alone, it looks like the brand missed the discount guarantee and the, the generic did much better than the guarantee. If those guarantees were bundled, the savings, the surplus from that AWP on the generic can be applied to the brand to cover the spread that lost 1% and hit the brand guarantee. Ultimately, what that means is no penalty payout from the PDM. Put some math against that. Let's say the difference between that 20% and that 19% is $100,000. $100,000 deficit, they missed it by that amount. But the generic, the difference between the 85 and the 88, was actually $150,000 surplus. That was additional savings that you got. When bundled, they can take that $100,000 surplus out of that 150 and move it over to the brand to cover the deficit, and all of a sudden, boom, both guarantees are met. Which is why we like them unbundled. Because if they're unbundled, the surplus savings from the generic can't be applied to the brand which means you can't move money over. So that would trigger a penalty payout from the PBM of that $100,000 deficit that they had by missing the brand guarantee. That's why, again, devil's in the details, understanding how those discounts interact or they don't interact. And you want to look for guaranteed pricing on all generics, not just some of them. Because if they give you solid discount guarantees on, say, 95% of the generics, that 5%, those are, the, that are excluded, those are probably the ones that are most volatile in price, and they need to guarantee the most. So get all of them packaged. And you want to seek rebate and generic fill rate guarantees as well. Prevents unreasonable quoted plan savings. So they may tell you that their generic fill rate is going to be 99%, but without a guarantee behind it, is that even a real number? And you want to include provisions or penalties if the PDM breaches those guarantees because, well, let's be honest, money has a funny way of uh, incenting people to actively manage and help contain your costs. Make sure they care more about hitting these sorts of guarantees than when they're trying to say how, tell you how quickly they can answer the phone when you call. Time to pick the plans. Contract plan. This is where we start getting into more of the details of what, what needs to be in there to help contain costs. First is reduce and eliminate those margin areas. We talked about this earlier. In fact, PBMs charge the employers one rate and reimburse pharmacies at another, and they keep the difference. They're keeping the change. That applies both the discount and the dispensing fees. We talked about this and had a money flow chart in uh, PBM 201 around this. Strategies aggressively negotiate proposed discounts and fees. 
request the PBM match the discount or fee paid to the pharmacy on that per claim basis. In other words, what you're charging me is what you're paying them. What that does, eliminates or reduces that PBM margin area. In the PBM world, as you can tell, is technical and complicated. We have five employees with a PM, PBM specialist designation at Haran, experts that can help. Haran has also built a data bank of network discounts, fees, and guarantees based on group size, industry, and PBM that will help us negotiate on behalf of our clients. Exactly. I hope that you're in this alone. Uncover and eliminate unnecessary fees. PBMs, they can charge extra fees on a per claim or per member basis, a la carte. For example, prior off, one of those top five primary strategies that, that we mentioned earlier, they may say, yep, we'll do that, but we're going to charge you $2.50 per claim. So they're charging for utilization controls, different clinical programs. Strategy is that we don't want to do it a la carte. We want a package deal. Now, we're not saying just throw the $2.50 in and give me the total cost. We want to get a competitive package deal with a savings guarantee. Flat. Include all those services. And you want to avoid buying any additional utilization of clinical services without a savings guarantee. They come in with the shiny new toys. Make sure there's a guarantee about it. If they claim that the program has this ROI or will provide this level of engagement, have them back it up. That's why you want that guarantee. Make them work for it. Ultimately, what it does, it says unnecessary charges, get what you pay for, higher value. takes us to price protection. We're talking about price protection. What, I'm, what, we're, what we say is the, defini is the definition is it guarantees the net pricing will not increase above an agreed upon percentage. And if the price increase exceeds that percentage, the employer pays the difference. Inflationary protection. For example, keep talking about the proposal. It has brand AWP minus 19%, which is a strong guarantee. But what we want to do is we want to guarantee that AWP, that starting point, doesn't increase over three years. If you look at the math, for three years, yep, you're still getting AWP minus 19, three-year rate guarantee, but you'll see the AWP went from $100 in year one, $105 in year two, $110 in year three. So over the course of three years, that AWP went up 10%. If you had price protection, that would say 5%, the PBM would pay the employer the difference in charges. Now, AWP, the average wholesale price, that is a factor of WAC, the wholesale acquisition cost. So, to be able to control the AWP is a function of WAC, which forces the PBM to have strong contracts with the manufacturer so the price increase doesn't get passed on to you and pushes your cost up. Now, plans that have price protection provisions right now, only about a third. Two or three years ago, most PBM contracts didn't include this, didn't even want to talk about it. But again, as employers are getting more informed about the intricacies of a PBM contract, this is becoming a very hot topic. We're seeing this as a growing trend. Now we're going to tend the garden. Particularly with specialty. Things to consider with your specialty meds. First is require mandatory prior office step therapy reauthorization every six to nine months. Because you want to make sure the right path is still working, that there's no new alternatives out there, that there haven't been any sort of complications. It keeps it from being complacent. So it keeps them on their feet, make sure that it's still taking the right, the right drug at the right price at the right time. Investigate the PBM of, with possibilities of outcome contracts with guarantees. So much like you see on the medical side where a doctor's contract, their compensation is tied to the outcome of patients, why not have that on the pharmacy side of PBM? Tell them to put their money where their mouth is. If the manufacturer says the drug does this and it does it really, really well and it's going to produce those results, get a guarantee behind it. And require enhanced reporting. Let's think of how it integrates with medical costs. What are the adherence levels? Don't just settle for standard reporting or have that enhanced reporting fall into an ad hoc category. 
Because when it falls into an ad hoc, it may cost the plan extra. So again, be greedy about the type of reporting that you, you, you need, specifically when it comes down to specialty, because it's driving the overwhelming majority of pharmacy spend right now. Understand the bio, biosimilar options that they offer. Remember, a biosimilar is an alternative to a specialty drug. Now, it's not an exact replica. You can't call it a generic, but it produces a very similar outcome at a much lower price. Not a lot of them are out in the marketplace right now. But again, growing trend. Understand the PBM's timeline. Do they have that list? Is it growing? When is it going to roll out? What what benefits are they, what uh, conditions are is it to to, to uh, cover? It then requires a lower size care for these specialty drugs. Now that's not to say you're trying to compromise the safety or the outcome of the patient. What we're saying is they have to have a specialty med delivered. Is it being delivered at the lowest cost of site? Is it at is it being done at a hospital? where it could be done at an outpatient facility? Is it done at an outpatient facility that could be done at a primary care office or is it something that could be self-administered at home? Have the language in this so it drives it to the optimum level. Again, not compromising the health of the patient, but just optimizing where it's being delivered to keep the cost down. But don't forget, again, don't forget about those rebates. You want to get a pass through, particularly on these specialty, get that minimum guarantee because you want to optimize that amount often as you can. Another item of specialty comes in the form of the manufacturer copay programs. And we're spending a little time on this because a lot of moving parts here. So the issue is, is plans that have an accumulator for the manufacturer copay programs. So what you see in front of you is, is it's a chart, 12 months, talking about a $4,000 specialty med that needs to be taken every single month. We're going to assume the plan design has a $4,000 out-of-pocket max, and the plan has a four-tier, has that four-tier pharmacy card where this specialty falls under that fourth tier, and that fourth tier is a 20% copay. That's what the member pays for that drug. So for a $4,000 drug, the 20% cost is $800. 20%, 8,000, that's what the member would pay without the coupon from the manufacturer. But the manufacturer in this situation is offering the member a $750 coupon for that $800 drug. So that creates the issue. So while they would be paying the 800, they're in actuality paying less. Because of that 800, 750 of it is being, caught, is being covered by the manufacturer, which means the member is actually only paying $50. But the problem is the plan thinks the member paid $800. So that $800 is what was applied to the out-of-pocket maximum. So what happens is every single month, the manufacturer is helping the member. The member is only paying $50 per month, but the plan thinks it's paying $800 a month. So over time, it keeps going towards more and more towards the out-of-pocket. And by the fifth month, the member just hit their out-of-pocket maximum. The out-of-pocket maximum was 4000 even though they only paid $250 in co-pays, the plan thinks it paid 800 because it took into consideration that coupon. So what happens is they hit that out-of-pocket maximum, then the plan picks up the full cost of that drug for the rest of the year, $4,000. Ultimately, for that plan year, cost the plan $44,000, even though the employer only paid two hundred and fifty. dollars And Michael, the good news is there's programs to support this and change this. And Optum, ESI, CVS, Caremark are doing this now, and Anthem and Genio starts one one twenty one. Exactly. Finally. Thank goodness. They got to get to it. That's the solution. So let's look at the solution Judy was just talking about. Again, drug hasn't changed in price. Only now the solution is we don't have any accumulator of that copay. So with that $800 drug, I mean $800 cost to the member, manufacturer is helping them out, give them that $750 for the member, so I'm paying $50 bucks just like they were before. However, now the plan knows it only pays $50. So just the $50 now applies to the out-of-pocket maximum. We've corrected the issue. We removed the value of the coupon from accumulating towards the out-of-pocket maximum. So 
over the course of the year, you'll see it's processing correctly. So rather than hitting the out-of-pocket maximum in the fifth month, he keeps paying, he, she keeps paying that copay over the course of the year. They never hit their out-of-pocket maximum. They paid their $600 in copays, $600 went towards the out-of-pocket maximum, and the plan cost needed to pay that $3,200. If you look at it, with and without, what's the dollar difference? Well, by not accumulate, accumulating that, that coupon towards the out-of-pocket maximum, it increases the drug manufacturer's contribution. They pay $5,200 more. The member, their contribution increased to $350. But the employer costs actually generate savings. They paid $5,600 less. Now, you might be sitting there saying, well, that's not really, that's not really fair for the employer, for the employee to now pay more for the drug. Well, they're not paying more for the drug. The plane's operating as designed. It was always designed and intended for them to pay that $50. They just omitted that, that, that coupon from the out-of-pocket accumulator so that they're paying the correct amount. Mark beat this. Don't rush it. Give yourself plenty of implementation time, three to six months from your open enrollment. That way you can negotiate penalties for missing those deadlines. Leave it to the experts. Let the PBM design the formula. I've had conversations with clients over the years where they want to decide and build, decide what drugs are on that list and literally customize and build their own drug list. Leave it to the PBMs. They're the experts, they have the background, they have the knowledge. They're not going to jeopardize the member health. So they don't necessarily look at cost while it's a factor. They look at the overall efficacy of drugs, determine what comes on the list and what comes off the list. And they make adjustments over the course of the year. And ID, ID issues quickly. Address any reporting or transfer, transfer issues early on. Any sort of disruption. Which leads us to the other sort of disruption. Know who's impacted. When you change PBMs, PBMA to PBMB, who's going to be disrupted? When I say disruption, what I mean is what drugs are changing tiers? What drugs are excluded altogether? When we see changes in PBMs, the disruption typically comes in a drug changing tiers. So the PBM will say, yep, yeah, we cover every single drug that you have on your formulary right now. Covered it all. Same thing. What I'm not telling you is, what is a tier one now may be a tier two with them. What's a tier two now may be a tier three with them. And that could be a result of they just have stronger utilization programs. They have stronger mandatory generics or prior authorization or step therapy. That's where you see the shift. You want to understand that sort of disruption so that you can make an informed decision, plus make sure that there's outreach to the membership to know that they're going to have disruption. And you want to maintain the data integration. Make sure the medical plan is integrated with the pharmacy. Make sure you have a complete picture of what's going on inside the plan, as well as making sure all programs are being triggered under the medical side or the pharmacy side because the data is flowing back and forth. And trust but verify. Scrutinize all of those clinical programs. Again, they may quote that they do all of these wonderful things. Let's look into the details. Look for the guarantees. Make sure that the programs are worth the value for what they are charging for. Specifically, we're talking about case management and disease management. Some other considerations. Flexibility and formulary design. Meaning, how many drug lists do they have? How often do changes occur? Do they make changes once a year? Do they make it quarterly? Do they make it every Every three months, every four months, understand when drug lists can possibly change. And plan ahead for the breakout. Understand what is the potential if you have a, if you move from them to a new PBM in the future. Because what you're trying to do is avoid exposure to any transfer fees or any carve-out fees. If you leave. Not to say that you ever will. 
you may transition to a new PBM and be there for a very long time, but always plan for the breakup to avoid unnecessary costs. They average RX trends. What's their track record? That's for history. How's their book been running the last three or five years? Get references from existing employers that have been with them for a while. Ask them how their programs are working. Just take it at face value. Do some digging. Reporting flexibility and costs. We hit on this earlier with the specialty, but this should apply to all reporting. Understand what standard is. Understand what ad hoc is. Getting alignment on what standard means is very important. If I ask all of you that are listening today, I, I ask you to picture a horse in your mind. I guarantee you'd have different shapes, sizes, and colors of horses. Same thing with standard. What you may think is standard, they may think is an ad hoc, and they'll charge you for it. Get alignment on it. Make sure you understand what's available. Proof is in the pudding. What does the data say? Look for high generic utilization percentages. What we started off with, right, when we're clearing the ground. But you also want to look for low average generic and brand RX costs. And Michael, how about the length of a PBM contract? And if you're in a multi-year, what happens if you term early? That's a great question. We talked about uh, the importance of getting a multi-year discount, multi-year contract with PBM which is great, but you've got to understand the fine print. So terminating early could be, there could be a termination fee, there could be a loss of rebates, there's, un, there's, there's costs involved by going away. Not saying that's the reason to avoid a multi-year contract, it's just understand A, what the impact is for that, and B, what is the timeline for notice? Because they may say you have to let them know 90 days in advance. Just understand the exit strategy and what costs are involved, and then negotiate those if you can to get rid of those to avoid it. Your question. Let's touch on some tools to help in the garden. Some alternative programs. First one is GoodRx. Now this is free to use. It's a telemedicine platform. It provides free Rx coupon for discounts on medication. Now their advertising said it could save your member up to 80% on their prescription payments. Now this rules outside of the plan, but doesn't go towards the out-of-pocket maximum. But it could give your members the opportunity to save on their prescriptions uh, on a free-to-use platform. There's the website to, to go and check out the list. But then you also have GoGo Meds. It's also free to use. But rather than a telemedicine platform, it's actually an online pharmacy. What they have is a price comparison tool. Well, they'll give you the, the price of their drug plus the price of three other PBMs. It's not an all-inclusive list. It doesn't include every drug out there. It's limited to about 1,000 drugs, prescriptions, but they're pretty common, in addition that they offer home delivery. Also operates outside of the plan, so it doesn't go towards the out-of-pocket maximum. But again, complements your PBM strategy and can allow your members to get drugs at a much, a much more discounted cost than what they see inside of the plan. Again, it's a website. But then you have Scout RX. Now this, this is more cutting edge. This is a, a, a new approach I mentioned at the beginning. And rather than complementing your PBM strategy, this becomes the new PBM strategy. So what Scout RX does is they partner with another PBM called Proact. They carve out specialty altogether. Specialty is no longer covered underneath the plan. And the reason that they completely carve it out is they want to be able to tap into primarily the manufacturer assistance programs, which allows, uh, allows people to get drugs at a reduced cost based on salary needs. So by completely carving it out, they work to get manufacturer assistance for the employees, for the membership, to get a drastic, drastically reduced cost. If they can't get through manufacturer assistance, then they go to the copay card programs, which we talked about earlier. And if they can't get the assistance through the copay program, they have a relationship with an international pharmacy in Canada, in Montreal. This is a little more drastic, a little further down on the spectrum, but they are quoting first year savings on your pharmacy spend is 43% because of the ability to carve out the specialty. With Scout, with Scout RX, again, that requires further conversation. If you want to learn more about that, then we can, you can contact your Haran team member and we can delve into it a little bit further. But just want to let you know that it is out there. It's more of an aggressive approach to things. Now, if you split these three across those different categories, we talked about gardening today. The Good RX and the GoGo Meds is more about preparing the soil. Where's your Scout RX? I would drop that into the tending the garden section because it 
a little more aggressive. And Michael, as far as like a Scout RX, we have a team of people who are actually looking at different PBM solutions. And I know you're part of that team to take real client data and see the impact so we can really assess what good options there are out there and how those programs work. Exactly. So we have, so we work with a handful of our clients that have agreed to allow us to de-identify all of their data. And when these solutions are presented to us, rather than relying on their white papers or their results, we now have our own data that we can run the water through the pipes to see how good these programs are, see if they're as good as they say. That way, when we start talking to our other clients about it, we have real results based on our real data. And lastly, it's really interesting because Kroger is advertising a membership pro program that's powered by GoodRx. It has an annual fee and suggests lower cost drugs. So it's really good for consumers, but be careful because pharmacists don't process it through the insurance company, but you can file a paper claim. Typically, single source brand drugs have no better discount, but you may get savings on generic and multi-source brands. So with your PBM garden, just like any garden, no two are alike, but they all need to be watered, they all need to be tended to. And Haran has the resources to help, help you grow that garden. We are here to provide the guidance and our green thumb expertise to help you plant the right, plant the right plants, make sure they grow the right way. And that allows us to help contain costs and have you better educated about your PBM contract. Now this brings us to the end of uh, PBM 301. At this time, we're going to see, we're going to review to see what questions were submitted. And you must have done a great job because we have no questions. You must have perfectly explained okay. it. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, for those who, if you may have questions now, but if you are sitting on information and it starts to come to you later that you need additional help or further clarification, please do not hesitate to uh, reach out to us. Well, thank you, thank you again for attending. Make sure you have a great day and everybody stay safe.